Thank you very much. Um, this talk is a hacker's view to ISO SAE21434. And even though the title is rather complex and sounds like organizational security, I'm trying to uh, get the picture uh, on where we are regarding automotive security and what will happen in uh, the next few years. So I'm Martin. Um, I'm on Twitter. Uh, during the day, I work for uh, the automotive industry, but from the supplier point of view. Um, by night, I do digital forensics and uh, uh, work on applied privacy schemes, so um, privacy is kind of my thing. Um, in between, I have a very old car, uh, so uh, this car uh, is my experience in automotive hacking mostly, um, but it's built in the 80s, so all the fancy parts uh, which we have now in modern cars are not included, uh, not even closely. So everything here which is uh, electric is basically electric. There's no bus to communicate, there's no e-call, no airbags, uh, not even seat belts. So usual disclaimer, uh, this is me, not my employer. Um, also, I have the bird's eye viewed on the documents, but not the process. So uh, I'm not actively involved in the process to this standardization. Um, there are plenty of people uh, in the standardization process involved. Uh, so they might have a different take on why specific elements are part of the standard and uh, some are not. Um, however, um, I think uh, the, the current draft of this standard uh, is in a state which is somewhat presentable and this is why I'm here because I think uh, it's kind of an important topic and I'd like to encourage everyone to actually look into automotive security because it's actually fascinating itself. Uh, so all started, for me at least, uh, back in 2015 when Charlie Miller and Chris Valasek, they hacked the Jeep, they hacked uh, the entertainment system remotely uh, over the internet uh, and were able to send Khan messages. This was kind of like the super GAO for uh, the automotive industry. Uh, in the fallout, uh, they had to recall 1.4 million cars into the workshops, uh, which is among the most expensive things you can have as a car manufacturer. And of course, uh, people lose trust into your brand of cars and the, the implications are numerous and that did a pretty damaging uh, impact. Um, an interesting thing about uh, the fixes, so once they had the Black Hat talk and this video came online, um, they, um, they showed how they hacked those Jeeps and uh, one of the things which led them to connect to the, these cars over the internet were open ports which are reachable over the mobile network. So the car had a SIM card in it. It was used for connectivity features, pretty usual. Um, but the network was not separated from the regular network. So everyone within the mobile, uh, sub, uh, mobile provider uh, could find these devices. And basically, this is what, uh, exactly what they did. Yeah. And also interesting, the quickest fix uh, for these issues were that the uh, service provider, they dropped forwarding those packets. And this is like one IP table role. This was uh, conducted within hours. So the ISP, the network operator, cooperated in a way that uh, this issue was fixed within hours. Um, and just in the uh, fallout afterwards, uh, these devices were called into the workshops, they have been patched. Uh, some of them were patched remotely and um, yeah, it's an interesting story how uh, this all turns out. So this is second quite popular hack. It's uh, a so-called relay attack against a keyless entry system. So usually when you have a keyless entry system and I have one myself, it's really convenient. Um, when you come home, you drop the key next to the entrance and uh, this was caught on video how the 
thieves in that particular case stole the car. They had two devices. They extended the range of the overall uh, keyless system, uh, got into the car, drove away, um, and were out of the country probably within hours. Uh, interesting thing here is that if the key is no longer present in the car, uh, the user gets an indication saying, hey, you maybe forgot your key. If you turn off the engine, you will not be able to start it again. Uh, but the engine is allowed to run, and it runs and runs and runs. Uh, uh, as long as you do not turn it off. Last year, uh, there was another Black Hat talk. It was by Keen Labs. Uh, again, they do amazing research in vulnerability um, identification, and they hacked BMWs, expensive ones. Um, they do pretty, pretty good stuff. Uh, on the left, there's the list of the CVEs and uh, so forth. But um, yeah, hacking cars is common, and uh, yeah, it actually works remotely over Wi-Fi or, or over wireless networks, um, which is kind of scary. So the overall motivation for this talk is that vehicles are complex. If you buy a modern car, you have about 100 microcontrollers in there. They control and uh, configure everything that you move in the car or that can be moved uh, from lights to airbags to brakes to the engine. Um, everything is tightly coupled. They're highly intervened. They need to communicate with each other uh, using various protocols. Um, and often they have real-time requirements, meaning that if uh, some sensor detects a crash, you really want the airbag to detonate within milliseconds or microseconds even um, to prevent the passengers from actually hitting the car. Um, However, security not a priority to, so far, so history is bound to repeat itself. We had same issues for, I don't know, 30, 40 years ago when the public internet was uh, invented. Security hasn't been an issue. Uh, look where we are now. Um, it would be great if we wouldn't have to repeat all the errors we did back then, um, but uh, we're on the best way to actually do that. So this is the... the network map of a modern car. It's from a paper uh, which uh, took a Skoda, some car, modern car, 2017 model, um, and they mapped all the different uh, ECUs and components which are part of the uh, actual car. So usually at top you have the OBD port. This is mandated by uh, California and US based laws that you have to have this diagnostic port. Um, you have then the gateway module, which more or less separates the different networks. Uh, this separation is not due to uh, security reasons, would be great, uh, but actually it's for uh, bandwidth reasons. So you couldn't put every ECU on the same bus simply because the bandwidth is uh, much too small. Um, and you can see you have different buses, you have uh, chassis cars, uh, chassis bus, uh, you have a comfort bus, somewhere is the in infotainment system, uh, and they can communicate with all the other buses uh, happily ever after over the gateway. And if the gateway is not built to actually filter frames and messages sent between um, those different buses, then this is just one gigantic um, possible broadcasting network. Another problem is that software updates for cars are not a thing yet. So we have software updates for plenty of devices, ranging from our smartphones uh, to operating systems, uh, whatever you name it. Um, and updating software in cars is still uh, stigmatized. So every car vendor would love to have the cap capability to actually push updates over the internet, no workshop involved, um, have them signed and have them transported securely, but uh, this is not yet uh, happening. Um, weakest part are often the customer, so I as a customer, if I buy a brand new car, I have no say in the architecture or uh, the software update policy, I have no idea how long I will receive software updates if there are uh, software updates planned, um, so I'm the one left in the dark. Uh, more or less. Interestingly, for car manufacturers, money is a great incentive. Uh, so they 
do build the cars as secure uh, as they need to be and as they some even go further and they derive uh, fascinating architectures on how to secure communication uh, common fear however is for one the uh, un the liability in the US uh, law meaning that if you toast your hamster you can be liable as a uh, manufacturer of a toaster um, and insurance costs so uh, if there is a specific car which is particularly easy to steal um, then the insurance prices for that car will go up and the car manufacturer will sell actually less cars uh, of that model so this is kind of the the balancing um, act between a car manufacturer, the customer, and uh, the rest of the world trying to be safe uh, from that actual uh, threat. Uh, so some background. Uh, in a car we have the so-called CAN bus. Uh, it's a rather robust communication channel which works uh, very well, has been invented, I, think, I don't know, 30 years ago, um, and is a real-time protocol allowing communication between different uh, components. Uh, bandwidth is low, you have about a megabit tops, usually you have 250 or 500 kilobit. Uh, the payload is very small, you have 64 bit of payload per frame, uh, meaning that if you want to add encryption or authentication to that, this is really, really challenging because you have 64 bit of uh, data um, and you have to actually split uh, the, the, this area, one part for the data you want to send and the other part for a signature. And I don't know that many signature themes, uh, schemes, but 64 bit tops capacity sounds like a real uh, challenge to me. And of course no security uh, built in there. Uh, so the only security in there is that you have arbitration. So if two different components are talking at the same time, the one with the higher priority assigned will win. So you have prioritized signals that can go back and forth. Um, and uh, yeah, in essence, this is the holy grail for uh, automotive hacking. If you can send raw CAN frames, uh, it's just the same as if you got root on the box. Um, it's basically that what uh, everything, everyone is uh, trying to achieve. Uh, the attack surface uh, ranged from top to bottom is also quite um, large. Uh, you have physical attack surface, meaning that people will try to take out the chips and the control units try to reflash it with a different firmware. And um, most commonly, this is used for chip tuning. So you have the car, uh, you flash a different software, and all of a sudden you get 20 horsepower more. Um, of course, this is not uh, allowed and shouldn't be done, uh, but this is the, the most basic uh, physical attack uh, against the car uh, there is. Then you have the wireless protocols. Every modern car is equipped with a multitude of wireless communication uh, capabilities. You have wireless key fobs, which allow you to approach the car and enter it uh, without actually doing anything. You j just have the key in the pocket and it works. Um, tire pressure sensors. So back in 2010, uh, there was a neat attack against the tire pressure sensor because they were not communicated communicating securely uh, and using a, a radio uh, which you could program, you could send more or less CAN frames by mo manipulating the tire pressure values. Uh, you have the infotainment system, so all the big breaches, uh, not the breaches, but the big hacks in recent years uh, where cars have been hacked, uh, most of them used the infotainment system. There was uh, pwn to own last this year, um, and they, uh, Tesla participated, and they, uh, whoever hacked the car, did it via the unpatched browser and the infotainment system. Yeah, if you're getting physical, there's always an OBD2 port in the car. It's a standardized uh, connector. You can connect to it and then talk directly with the car. This is what every workshop tool does to actually read out the error messages to get an information on the state of the car uh, and so forth. And increasingly there are backends, so every car is connected, it talks via public network, private network, whatever, uh, to some backend, it sends some data. Uh, there are APIs available to, act, I don't know, start the heater in your car remotely. Um, and this is also part of the uh, attack surface, of course. 
Some interfaces, it's not only limited to CAN. You have a multitude of wired and wireless protocols that the car is able to speak. Uh, you have FlexRay MostLin. Those are bus-based systems to uh, exchange data at a higher data rate. Uh, you have automotive Ethernet, which is not the standard Ethernet that we put into our walls to connect our devices, but it's a twisted pair uh, gigabit uh, Ethernet. Um, still, it's Ethernet, so uh, all the tools and uh, the different parts uh, of the um, available literature uh, should work. Uh, you have wireless in the different spectrums which are openly available, used for key fobs or um, whatever. And of course, convenience, you have NFC, Wi-Fi, Bluetooth. Um, if you have a, a phone book which will be synchronized with the car, uh, of course, that's a um, an attack vector as well. Uh, most of these things have no security specified. They're just built to work within a car and in the challenging environment of a modern vehicle. Um, most of them have no security or it's optional. So Bluetooth, um, we should all know, uh, can be made secure, uh, but it has to be configured properly and to actually be encrypted and authenticated and uh, without anyone being able to do a man-in-the-middle attack, for example. Then we have GSM LTE. Um, this is in Europe mandatory, so if you buy a new car today, this is mandatory to have the e-call feature. Uh, if the airbag detonates uh, into your face, uh, it will automatically do the um, call for help. Usually, this interface is only activated when the airbag detonates, so you don't have the always-on connection, which is trackable by the uh, service provider. Um, but still, it's mandate, mandated by law that you have to have a SIM card in your car, uh, which is able to actually do the e-call. Um, and you not only have one, you have multiple uh, SIM cards. So these things are connected. Some of them are able to speak GSM. So you could do IMSI Catcher, deploy it with a USRP next to the car uh, and try to actually uh, communicate with the car over this communication channel. Uh, and of course, there's vehicle to uh, vehicle to vehicle communication, vehicle to infrastructure, vehicle to um, whatever. Uh, this is currently being developed. These are protocols which we'll see in the next five years. Um, they have security to some extent built in there. Um, we will see which of those protocols will uh, prevail, but um, currently there are two protocols which are discussed. One is based on LTE technology, uh, the other one is based on Wi-Fi. So they are built to communicate the information that there is a car, the direction, the speed, um, anything you can uh, imagine could be transported to nearby receivers uh, in the future. But best security measures so far, and this is uh, the, the, um, one of the things which actually makes uh, automotive hacking very expensive. If you want to hack an expensive car, you have to have access to an expensive car. Uh, and if you look at how you have to dismantle all the different body components to get access to the different ECUs, um, this is nothing which will happen over the, ni over the night or uh, at a weekend, so you cannot do it with a rental car, uh, but you have to have access to that. And um, most people don't do that for uh, money, but for fun. Uh, so you need to have access to a car, which you can then uh, actually do your hacking on. So this is a pretty dark picture. So we have plenty of uh, proprietary technology protocols. Um, we have uh, low accessibility for people to actually look into these things, um, which doesn't look so good uh, from a hacker's point of view. So we have challenges in getting access to those things. We have the problem of getting the information uh, that would be needed from a public Point, point of view uh, to actually look into the things that have been implemented. Um, this is not a good thing, this is, but this is the, the way it is right now. Uh, there's not much uh, we can do. So this brings me to the ISO part of the talk. Uh, there is currently an ISO standard being drafted uh, to actually improve uh, the security of 
cars and entire cars as well as uh, components. Uh, so currently, this is a committee draft. Uh, I don't know when it started. It's already probably three years back when uh, standardization of this process uh, began. Um, but uh, right now, the draft is about 120 pages. Some of them are only informative, so they have annexes, they have examples uh, describing the different steps uh, on how to actually uh, secure a car. It's internationally collaborated, so manufacturers are included as well as suppliers. Um, the general public is missing. Um, I will come to that uh, in a second. Um, and sometime next year it's expected to be released. So the uh, ISO standard uh, procedure says that Right now, we're in the community draft um, phase, uh, and once there is a uh, more or less public draft available, then the members will vote on accepting or uh, not accepting this as an international standard, um, and this is going to happen sometime uh, in 2020. So some fun facts, uh, when my background is in IT, um, so I studied computer science. Um, in the automotive world, the V model development process is still a thing, which is a good thing because you have complex things and Agile is not built to suit for any case. Um, however, when I first discovered this, I was like, what is this? Um, so V model development uh, still works. Um, in the entire draft, you have 822 occurrences of the word cyber security. So cyber is um, king. Uh, you have one time cyber security with a dash, so they're inconsistent. Um, and you have plenty of risks. Agile, only once. So what is the, the draft all about? Uh, in essence, it's um, risk management. So it takes the entire picture of how a component or how a vehicle will be used and tries to identify and then mitigate the risks that um, can be applied against uh, this component or car. Um, so uh, be it a component or be it the, the entire car, the, the goal is to identify the risks and make this thing uh, secure. Um, with everything that comes with it. So not just the development process, but also the operations and decommissioning, uh, which is a pretty good thing. Uh, it also can, includes vulnerability management, meaning that any manufacturer, any OEM, uh, which is actually um, committing themselves to this ISO uh, standard to be, uh, they have to have a, a process in place to, if there is a vulnerability identified, uh, then they need to be able to actually work on that. They need to process it, they need to provide updates, and, and this is a core component of the uh, entire uh, standard. It is based on uh, two things. One is the functional safety stand, uh, standard, which is a big thing in the automotive industry. So there's always the confusion between safety and security. Safety is built around that the thing you're looking at is not able to kill you. Um, and security is always about uh, that someone else could use this thing against you to kill you. So one, safety is for things against humans, uh, and security is uh, for things uh, against different set of humans. Um, there's also a internet, the SA, SAE standard, the sec security guidebook for cyber physical vehicle systems. Uh, this has been published beginning of 2016. Uh, and this was interesting because this came out shortly after the, like half a year after the um, Jeep hacks. Um, and it already includes a multitude of steps to actually secure things during development. Um, it doesn't speak much about uh, the usage of the product and how it can be uh, made secure during runtime, uh, but it includes a lot of steps during the development process, which is kind of uh, impressive. 
Also relevant ISO 31000-ish, uh, that's the standard risk management thing. Um, without reading the draft, this is just common sense. Uh, if you have a risk, you can identify the severity of manifesting that risk risk um, with the likelihood of this thing to happen. So this is what we do every time uh, we cross the street or we browse a website or we click an attachment uh, on an email. It's always how likely is it that this is going to uh, be bad uh, versus uh, what's the impact and uh, what will happen if I do. Also in 2016, the NHTSA, the National Highway Transport Security Agency in the US, uh, they published a best practice booklet on uh, cyber, uh, cyber security in cars, uh, also shortly after uh, the hacks. Uh, this is also pretty uh, complete in a sense uh, that it came at the right time and uh, did good. However, it wasn't mandatory, it can be audited uh, and so forth. Automotive industry is a bit slow, so um, everyone knew that it was there, um, but many didn't simply care. Um, also, quite recently, <coughs> the uh, UN body for economic, uh, they drafted a standard for security in cars as well as over-the-air updates. Uh, this is impressive because usually if the UN comes in and drafts something like this, it means that uh, all the others are late for the party. And in 2018, there was a California IoT security law published, uh, which is basically for everything which has an internet connection and is small enough to steal it, more or less, um, which could also mean that this applies to cars because they have an internet connection and they use it for uh, all kind of different things. Uh, one of the early documents was um, kind of interesting because it uh, recommended using an intrusion detection system in a car. And Imagine you have this complex beast of networks, distributed systems, um, and then someone tries, hey, wouldn't it be a great idea to actually do intrusion detection on those signals? And everybody was like, yes, it could work. We don't even get it right on the internet. Not sure what to look for. How do you do your baselines? and so forth. Uh, so th this made quite some confusing looks uh, from my side at least. Um, yes, you have a physically bounded thing that moves, uh, but just doing intrusion detection on the signals that are transmitted um, seemed a bit far-fetched uh, to me. So what's in the uh, standard itself, this is standard risk management. This is happening um, both for IT systems as well as uh, humans every day of their lives. Uh, you identify the assets, what is important to you, you identify possible vulnerabilities, uh, and then you get resulting threats. The risk value is uh, impact of the threat to manifest itself times the feasibility. Um, and uh, around these list of risks, you can then sort this list and then start um, mitigating them uh, accordingly to the risk value. Also, security goals, you want confidentiality, integrity, availability, uh, was also for Vehicles interest is freshness and uh, authenticity, of course. Um, you do not want the um, wiper controller to actually ignite the air pack, so uh, you have authenticity in there as well. Some basic examples, uh, you have the asset. The asset, for example, could be the engine control unit, which actually controls the engine, every part about it uh, for against and protected uh, against um, chip tuning. Goal is to preserve the integrity of the software in there. Uh, impact could be severe, so if anybody modifies the software of the engine control unit, uh, this could have severe consequences while you're driving, for example. Uh, engine shutting down due to an error state, this is not something you would like to have. Um, and feasibility is high because chip tuning uh, is a thing and you can buy tools uh, available online. 
outcome of this risk estimation is better do something about it, protect the integrity of the uh, software running in there, and this is actually happening. So um, you have integrity protecting mechanisms like secure boot, authenticated boot, uh, signed software updates to actually prevent someone from modifying the software of that particular component. If you take another example, you have the infotainment system, the thing which actually plays the sounds of the radio or whatever uh, it is you're listening to. Goal is availability, so uh, customers will be uh, rather fed up if the radio is not working or if they cannot couple their uh, smartphone with the car to listen to their music. Um, so goal is availability. Impact, if that doesn't work, uh, is rather low. It's frustrating for customers, but at least you can die of that. Uh, and feasibility is high. Outcome could be okay, but it's probably not, depending on uh, the particular circumstances. So this is happening for every component, for every vehicle, according to the draft prior to development. So before you actually start implementing stuff, you identify, okay, what are the risks, what are the threats, and how can I mitigate them to prevent uh, those threats to manifest themselves. Uh, next step then is to develop a security concept uh, to actually mitigate those risks. So you specify in that, okay, to prevent modification of software or uh, inspection of communication channels, you actually encrypt them, you put these things into the requirements um, and they uh, will then be implemented. These can be requirements saying you need to encrypt every communication with the public internet end to end and you have to authenticate it um, and so forth. Can be also uh, not strict, uh, could be organizational measures, so proper training of developers, for example, could be a requirement to be fulfilled that people should know, okay, you're using C, C is a known language to be not uh, memory, um, not good regarding security with man memory management, uh, so you would like to have your developers trained. trained. The standard then describes you develop your software, you verify that actually the thing you build is according to the expectation you have, uh, and then you validate the entire concept, uh, for example, using a penetration test. This is interesting because um, if you uh, apply or if you want to follow this uh, standard eventually, uh, this will mean you have to have someone externally of the development process to actually verify um, that the things you did are sane and uh, the product is not able to, to be uh, in the headlines. This could be for one a penetration test, this could be also an audit to check the security organization um, and so forth. The good thing is it doesn't end here because uh, once the car is in the field, um, it uh, is still a valid attack. Uh, it still has a valid attack surface. Um, so um, the good thing about this particular ISO standard is that it doesn't take the development process into scope, but the entire lifetime of that thing, uh, which is great because usually it was, you sell it, um, it's out there, uh, you're done as a manufacturer, um, but now the uh, responsibility lies even further until the end of life uh, of that particular car or uh, component. <clears throat> Meaning that once development is complete, uh, you should have a list of the residual risks um, specifying, okay, this could happen, uh, but it's too funky to actually mitigate it, or impact is too low to actually um, do something about this. These residual risks are not static, so every time a new attack arrives by some conference presentation, uh, the first thing you can do is take the list of residual risks, re-evaluate them if one of those risks gets more likely or impact gets more severe, to uh, redo the analysis step and then again triage, figure out what is it and how does it work. Uh, it also includes aspects for production security. Um, some aspects of uh, production are uh, 
rather interesting uh, to say it like that. Um, having key management uh, is uh, useful if you have individual cryptographic keys in uh, different components. You really would like to have some key management. You would like to track the serial number with the key. You need to know who is in possession of the key um, and so forth. And also production is usually not a one shot. So once a car is made, it's made for five, six, ten years. Uh, then it's refurbished or upgraded. Um, but the entire process is not done by simply say, great, we're going to production. Uh, thanks for everything. It then goes even further. Once uh, the, the thing is in the field, you have the operations and the maintenance phase where um, actually incidents can happen. So you as uh, the producer have to monitor, you have to triage for incidents and then do proper incident response. So figuring out, okay, how did this attack occur? Did you, uh, can you verify that it actually is uh, valid? Uh, and then do incident response. Um, in the end of the day, it boils down uh, to updates. Um, so once some issue is identified that needs an update, uh, there has to be a process in place to actually do updates. Um, it also trickles down the supply chain. So if you're just, uh, as a manufacturer, getting uh, components, you will likely need your supplier to be um, able to ship updates and so forth. So this is um, our current position, at least my, uh, that uh, we are part of the supply chain, we have suppliers ourselves, uh, and now the responsibilities trickle down to, to the last end of the supply chain, like the chip makers or um, the, the manufacturers uh, which are contracted. Um, this will be interesting. And in the end, you have a decommission phase. So once this thing is no longer expected uh, to be alive, it can be killed. And uh, then responsibility regarding security ends. That's it. So. What's my take on this? Um, basically, I think it's a great approach um, it, to make this an international standard. Cars are uh, a rolling distributed system with a attack surface as large as the butt of an elephant, more or less. Uh, so cars are currently a challenge to secure them properly. Um, one thing on the uh, standardization process, ISO has a business model of actually uh, selling those standards. So they are not keen on open development of these standards, which is, um, in my particular view, not a great thing uh, to have. Um, so standardization process is closed, NDAs have to be signed. Uh, every time I talk to someone, uh, if I can get a copy of the current draft, for example, then, ah, have you signed the NDA? Yes, of course, I've signed the NDA. Um, however, uh, it's 2019, soon to 2020. Um, I really thought uh, we are over this. Um, to quote Kenny Patterson, Kenny Patterson is my hero in uh, back in the standardization of TLS 1.3, uh, there was a discussion about RSA's, uh, RSA key transport. Uh, someone from the banking industry came and said, hey, um, we thought we could keep RSA key exchange alive because we need it. We're need to comply with the laws. Um, and uh, Kenny Patterson then responded, you're a bit late to the party. Uh, further down, he said, um, I know the banking industry is usually a bit slow, but this takes the biscuit uh, with the uh, UK dryness of humor. Um, so I would really like uh, to see more openness in uh, developing such uh, standards because it could make sense uh, to include a broader range. Um, and in the end, someone will complain they have not been involved, they didn't participate in the standardization process, or they are not um, keen on actually following it. Um, as usual, with everything that is uh, technical related with risk, the devil is in the details. So um, if one of the good things that comes out of this uh, standard is that the awareness is made that, okay, you need authentication, you need to encrypt your communication, uh, and so forth. Um, but the devil is always in the details. So um, there are 
is likely to be a project or a vendor or I don't know, sure we take your privacy serious, but um, sure we use secure boot, but we store the key in unprotected memory. These are likely phrases that might or might not actually happen, um, but if they eventually happen, I call dips on them. Yeah, sure we use TLS, but we don't pin. Uh, has happened uh, for smartphone apps, has happened for everything on the internet. Um, I find it unlikely to, um, that the automotive industry is not repeating this. Um, sure we have individual keys, but no true random number generator. So this is the Sony uh, flaw, which may or may not uh, actually manifest itself in uh, actually weakening encryption than uh, increasing it. So don't want to jinx it, but I think the, this standard will be good, mostly because uh, people will, um, at least manufacturer, suppliers, and uh, customers have something to talk about. So uh, they have a specific set of recommendations and requirements uh, that they can uh, walk along. However, cars are really, really complex. Uh, they uh, have again, an attack surface as large as a tent, um, and it's uh, all in the details. Uh, we'll see how that works out. So um, I'm optimistic, but I'm rather optimistic person. Uh, however, I feel that uh, we as a community, and in particular uh, as technicians who actually tinker with uh, our physical things, uh, can work on uh, improving that. Thank you very much. Is there a microphone angel running around? You have a microphone? <laughs> um, I'll repeat the question for the stream. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, so the question was if there's anything regarding autonomous driving in there. Uh, not specifically, no. This is a distinct topic. Uh, there are, there's a different SEA standard which defines the different levels of uh, autonomous driving that I'm aware of, but that doesn't, doesn't include security. So they are kind of distinct. And uh, of course, if you want to have autonomous driving, it's a good thing to actually include security. So the awareness is, is there in that regard, but it's not included in this standard. Got them. <laughs> Any other questions? Great. So I'll be around. Uh, I think next item on the uh, timetable is lunch. Um, thank you very much.